So happy birthday to Glurl, first off. Um, uh, ironically, I'm turning 50 on Sunday, so I've been reflecting a lot recently about how when somebody or something turns 50, we should really celebrate them and buy beers for them at a banquet or things like that. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, Ed Rutherford asked me to submit a talk for this session, and Ed's not here. He also ducked out on Doran's talk, so he couldn't field any questions, I see. Uh, and um, uh, when I went to submit the, the, pres the abstract, I noticed that Ed actually wasn't one of the uh, conveners of this session. And then I looked at who actually uh, presented today. It was a lot of longtime Glural uh, employees or current Glural employees. I've never worked for Glural. And so I kind of feel like uh, a little bit like uh, Admiral James Stockdale, who some of you may remember was uh, Ross Perot's running mate, who started off the first vice presidential debate by saying, who am I and why am I here? And then everything went kind of downhill from there. Um, so um, what I, my sort of, uh, pitch here is that I'm an example of somebody that spent a lot of their early career working with Glural uh, and developed uh, a lot of uh, research experience that I took on to another position. I think there are several people that have done the same over the years, and I think that's another really important attribute, a uh, really important contribution uh, of Glural. So Ed mentioned some of this earlier. Uh, I did some of my PhD research uh, with folks at Glural, first working with Ed when he was at U of M together with um, uh, Dave Schwab and Mike McCormick looking at uh, fish distributions relative to Coast Watch data, then working on uh, alewife uh, and how they are uh, invected around Lake Michigan using drifters and models, a variety of field studies um, to try to understand this. Um, this was working with Ed and Doran and Dave Schwab and Dima Beletsky and Mike McCormick and Tom Crowley and Hank Vanderplug and a variety of other people. Uh, and that's really, um, sort of influence what I do now. So as director of Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, we have outreach uh, um, products that are based entirely off of that work that we that I did back as a PhD student. And I have grad students that are following up on some of this research now, also now together with folks at Grill. Um, in 2005, after I got my PhD, I worked at what was then Siler as a research investigator. Um, and I worked on a variety of different projects. IFL, International Field, Field Year on Lake Erie, this was something that Steve Brandt uh, helped develop. I worked, Steve hired me as a research investigator there together with Don Scavia. Uh, and then Don Scavia led this big Ecofor project. Both of these involved first trying to understand the ecological effects of hypoxia on Lake Erie and then modeling it. And then I got involved with a number of other projects too, like for instance, working with Tom Nalef on unsuccessfully trying to figure out why diaparia, why diaparia were uh, declining in Lake Michigan. But what I'm going to focus on today is another uh, project that started up at that time, uh, which was the Saginaw Bay Multiple Stressors Project. Um, this was a large project. It was kind of fun going back and looking at the proposals when this project was developed. It changed a lot. It went through, as Craig, who was the PI on this, can remember, we, it changed a lot leading up. It probably, like, it went a complete 180 turn at the last second. Uh, but somehow it got funded. Um, and the basic idea was to develop a, a project where we would start by engaging with managers to try to understand what their needs were and use that to sort of drive what field studies to do, what empirical studies, what models to run, then take that information back to, to managers and then have them help us influence what the next round was. And so the idea was to do this, or more specifically do this, in, multiple times in a five-year period which probably was a bit naive. Uh, I think we might have gotten through like a half cycle. Um, but we got a lot of cool um, information out of it anyway. Um, so to start with, with this project, we started off having a lot of meetings with managers to try to understand what people cared about in Saginaw Bay. And what, what they cared about apparently were number one, muck. They cared a lot about muck. So a lot of people uh, as part of this project, studied muck and why there was so much muck on the Saginaw Bay beaches. Um, myself and Steve Hotover and a, a few others focused on the fish side instead. Um, and the issue in Saginaw Bay was that uh, for a long time, alewife had been really dominant in Lake Huron. And in 2003, alewife crashed. And as a consequence of alewife crashing, um, there was this big effect on the dominant fish populations in Saginaw Bay. Uh, walleye and yellow perch. Um, 
Notice that this says MDNRE. There was like a two year period where the Michigan DNR and the DEQ were combined into the MDNRE. And so I made this graph back during that two year period when they were the same thing. Uh, so that's not a typo. Um, so um, when AOI crashed, walleye abundance really uh, took off. Um, and probably because alewife were not eating little baby walleye anymore. Um, yellow perch reproduction also increased dramatically after alewife collapsed. However, that uh, high reproductive success didn't turn into yellow perch recruits. And so one of the first things we did with this project was to analyze this long-term time series that the uh, DNR had collected. Um, so alewife were gone. And this says present, what the Saginaw Bay food web was present. This was by present here, I mean 2008. So in 2008, alewife were gone, and there were also all these other invasive species that had come into Saginaw Bay. And on top of that, there were uh, changes in nutrient loading, changes in climatic conditions. And so we sought out, we sought through a variety of field studies, a lot of, of field work to try to understand this new uh, Saginaw Bay food web. Um, this ultimately led to a large number of research publications. A lot of these were sort of descriptive about what the Saginaw Bay food web looked like. Uh, some of them involved data analyses, a long-term time series or models. Um, and as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, this has also led to a lot of follow-up studies. So there's been a number of projects that uh, I've been involved with after this, in part because this getting involved with this large GLURL, GLURL project uh, back in 2008. And I'm just going to pull out a couple of examples here from things that came out of that project and sort of some of what it's led to after that. The first is um, walleye reproduction. So one of the things that we did as part of that project was collected larval walleye throughout Saginaw Bay. Um, we did this during 2009-2010. Um, and we then um, found that we were catching walleye all over the place. And we were interested in uh, whether or not um, the larval walleye that we were catching were coming from the Saginaw River. The thought was that all the walleye production was coming from the Saginaw River, um, but we thought it may be the case that some of the, some of the larvae were actually being produced elsewhere. And so we worked with Limnotech uh, to uh, use a hydrodynamics model, a particle transport model, to try to understand where these larvae were coming from. And what we ended up uh, finding was that early in the season, um, the walleye that we collected tended to be collected right at the mouth of the Saginaw River. And so they were probably coming out of the Saginaw River. But later in the season, the very young larval walleye, many of them were collected away from the Saginaw River. Um, and the hydrodynamic models suggested that they, there's no way they could have come from the Saginaw River, suggesting that there were other places in the bay that were producing walleye as well. And that was pretty exciting. Um, and through this project, I ended up going to a lot of fisheries uh, commission meetings, meeting with a lot of managers, um, fisheries managers. And one thing that they were very interested in was about the idea of trying to uh, promote more diversity and spawning habitat in Saginaw Bay. And so we ended up getting a grant from the US Fish and Wildlife Service as a sort of follow up to study that. And as part of that, we went out and sampled uh, remnant reefs in Saginaw Bay and two potential reef restoration sites. These are pictures of the remnant reefs in the top left there. The two uh, potential restoration sites are on the right Corian reef, and then the really kind of brownish red one is right at the mouth of the Saginaw River. Um, and we sampled these to try to figure out whether uh, fish were reproducing there um, using gill nets, using egg mats, brought a bunch of samples back to the lab, and then um, ultimately found that there was evidence of both whitefish and of walleye reproducing on, uh, in, in different areas in Saginaw Bay, including at these potential reef restoration sites. Um, and which then led to, together with some, um, bringing a lot of diverse groups together, led to actual reef restoration in Saginaw Bay. So in 2019, one of these potential reef restoration sites was restored. Um, uh, Corian Reef uh, by dropping a combination of granite and limestone on that. So here's a picture of when that uh, reef restoration was occurring. And the bottom right is an aerial photograph of what Corian Reef now looks like. Um, and then after that restoration, we went, I got another grant where we went back and actually assessed whether or not fish were using the restored habitat or not. 
Uh, this was done by uh, uh, Scott Kanigbauer, shown here on the right, a grad student at Purdue. A lot of this was during COVID, so this was kind of a complicated field uh, operation. Um, but what we found, uh, amongst other things, was that walleye were reproducing on this restored reef, and actually the amount of egg deposition on the reef in an area around the reef had increased from what it was before uh, restoration. So it seemed to be a general success. Um, and as I was just talking to with John Bratton, now there's a, a potential left, a potential to restore additional reefs in Saginaw Bay, and we're involved with some work uh, doing some pre-restoration there as well. So that's one example of sort of work that started at Glural that then went, um, that sort of led to some other stuff. Another example is looking at phosphorus loading into uh, Saginaw Bay and how that relates to fish production. Uh, so this is an image from a, um, from a paper that Craig uh, Stowe worked on. I think he worked with a grad student from Duke, if I believe correctly, uh, going, trying to retrospectively um, come up with uh, phosphorus loadings in Saginaw Bay back to the 60s uh, and showed how phosphorus loading had decreased over time, but had not quite gotten to the Great Lakes water quality uh, agreement target of 440 metric tons. Um, another thing that, um, Craig and others did as part of this project was to look at oxygen dynamics in Saginaw Bay. And they put out a, um, this buoy to track oxygen variation in, a, in one location in Saginaw Bay and show that it was highly variable. It bounced around a lot. Um, we've sort of built on this recently. Uh, first off, this is something that's led by uh, Paris Collingsworth, somebody that I collaborate with a lot at, at Purdue um, and together with a grad student, um, we put out oxygen loggers in Saginaw Bay and are tracking uh, where hypoxia develops on a much more broad horizontal basis in the bay than um, uh, what Glur was able to initially do. And uh, one thing we found as part of that is that there are times during the summer where you get uh, near bottom stratification and you get hypoxia that develops uh, in a pretty wide area of Saginaw Bay. Uh, it doesn't always hang around for that long, but uh, but it does develop and uh, it's present during a, in some part of the bay during a decent amount of time. Another thing that we did um, as part of the multiple stressors project related to phosphorus loading and here relating it to fish was to analyze how the fish community, the fish assemblage in Saginaw Bay had changed over time. Uh, and so this is a, an analysis that we've published back in 2014, where we show that the fish assemblage had changed dramatically from the 1970s. Uh, we had seen that uh, a lot of the more tolerant species, their numbers had gone down, sensitive species had increased, moderately tolerant uh, uh, species had increased. But one thing that was not very sort of satisfying with this analysis was that we couldn't, we didn't really directly relate it to phosphorus loading. And so we've taken a recently a somewhat different approach, we're trying to look at overall fish biomass in Saginaw Bay and how it relates to phosphorus loading. And the idea here is based upon this uh, curve developed by Caddy, um, where you have nutrient loading along the x-axis and you have fish reproduction on the y-axis. If you had a really unproductive system, an oligotrophic system, if you have increased nutrient loading, we would expect to see an increase in fish biomass uh, up to some point where we would expect to see a decrease because of things like hypoxia and a high preponderance of inedible algae that doesn't transfer very well up the food web. So we might see a decrease in fish biomass with really high nutrient loading at very high levels. Um, most of the times when people have thought about this, they sort of thought about going from the left to the right as things become more and more eutrophic. In Saginaw Bay, we've had an uh, opportunity to go potentially from the right side of this curve uh, to the left side. And so that's uh, what we did. Oh, and by the way, another sort of expectation with this is that we would expect that different feeding groups of fish would respond differently. We might expect that um, pelagic fish that are less affected by hypoxia uh, would peak at a higher phosphorus level than demersal fish that would be more affected by hypoxia. So we took um, estimates of, of phosphorus loading, either using the work that Craig did uh, before uh, or uh, more recent actual measurements of phosphorus loading and then related that to uh, fish biomass.
And we looked at the relationship between year uh, and fish biomass. So on the left here, the, uh, in the far left, that's total fish biomass. Note that it, fish biomass has peaked and it's since decreased more recently. Um, and then the other uh, plot here shows fish biomass divided up into uh, different um, feeding groups, benthivores, pythivores, and, um, uh, and planktivores. And we've also looked at this not only by year, but also by uh, phosphorus loading. And so this uh, plot here shows that uh, in terms of total fish biomass, uh, biomass peaked at a phosphorus load at about 650 uh, uh, tons per year. And the different feeding groups uh, seem to have peaked at different phosphorus loads as well. So note that the planktivores peaked at a phosphorus loading of about 950, and the benthivores peaked at a phosphorus loading of about um, 650. So I think the takeaway here is that um, we have seem to have peaked in fish biomass in Saginaw Bay, and that's occurred at a level, a phosphorus loading level that's well above the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement target. So there's gonna, there's gonna potentially be some trade-offs in Saginaw Bay between fish community, uh, fish biomass, and uh, some of these water quality metrics that people may be concerned with. All right, so I'll stop there and just again sort of um, make the point that I think I'm an example of, and there are many of us in the Great Lakes and throughout the country that uh, spent some time at Glural uh, or worked with Glural during an early part of our career and had a really, which had a really positive influence. And I think that's another really great attribute of, of Glural is that they've, uh, that uh, the lab has had such a effect, not only on the work the lab has done, but how it's influenced other people's works too. Thanks. We've got time for questions. Look like the, the fish biomass uh, is uh, not have a nonlinear uh, uh, consequences on the uh, uh, Newton loading. So how how do you balance out the loading and fish? Is one question, and also uh, the fish community apply this uh, this curve, quadratic curve, into the modeling. Um, yes. Uh, so, as far as I understand the question, I mean, I think ultimately it's a value judgment in terms of do we value fish more, do we value water quality endpoints more? And I, so in terms of balancing, I think it's very hard. Maybe we could put them, you can consider economics and, and think about the economic benefits of fish production versus the economic benefits of, of water quality. Um, but I think it's not, it's, they're different things. So you, I think there's some value judgments there. Um, and so this is just showing, um, you know, a regression approach to show this, but we have modeled it in the, and we can peak, we can uh, estimate the, the peak biomass and compare it to different types of curbs to figure out whether, they're, whether the biomass is actually peaked at, at certain phosphorus levels. Um, and you could look at this using other models too. And I think there are people that are, Doran was talking about various food web models uh, previously, and there are approaches using those food web models that you can get at similar questions. I think we have time for one more real quick question while we have the slides. Yeah, I'll just follow up on Gia's question uh, about the trade-off between the fishery and the water quality. This, this is gonna come to a head before too terribly long. We have a couple different regulatory programs underway that are gonna consider different endpoints. The state 303D program is interested in the harmful algal blooms and related water quality issues in Saginaw Bay and how that affects the fishery is not an explicit consideration. Uh, under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, uh, Annex 4, that's gonna reconsider the phosphorus target at some point in the, when we get enough data to do that. Both the fishery and the water quality question are gonna be considered. So we, and, and there's also the AOC process, which I, I don't fully understand the decision process there, but, but this, this potential trade-off and which side of the curve we wanna operate on is gonna have some, some real management implications and possibly some conflicting management decision-making going on before too terribly long. 
Yeah, I don't think there was a question there, but I agree with the statement. Thanks. Thank you.